Okay. We're good to go. All right. Um, well, today we're going to be talking about a project that myself and Russell, uh, who's on the chat with me, uh, completed last month on the structure of stand-up comedy uh, as, as understood through a routine by Ali Wong called Baby Cobra. And um, yeah, why don't you say hello as well, Russell? Hey, everybody. I'm Russell. I'm here again. How's it going? <laughs> this is, I guess, ep episode two of yep. explaining a thing that we made. All right. So I guess this whole entire thing should really start with where where the idea came from. Uh, Russell, do you want to give us some background on how you came about doing this project? Yeah. So uh, the project started let's see, about nine or 10 months ago, really. Uh, and I was watching a Netflix special, um, a Mike Birbiglia Netflix special, a stand-up routine. Um, and I kind of noticed in the story or at the end of his routine that it was kind of like one giant story. And he kept referencing things from previously in the routine. So I just kind of got like that curiosity in me. And it was just like, oh, I wonder if there's some sort of like anatomy or some way to uh, visualize what a, a stand-up routine looks like if there's structure like there is in other mediums um, and so that was kind of what set it off nice and uh, this was actually a really long journey I, when did you start working on this project yeah so I, I was looking at like my version history in google docs and it was like last may so it was really quite quite a long time ago definitely the longest i've worked on a project from start to finish for sure yeah, um, which is not entirely unique for projects we've taken on. There have been many multi-month projects, and that's not to say that you were working on it the entire time nonstop. Uh, like it had very, I think, well-defined like phases. Um, <laughs> that's definitely true. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we maybe go through, give people a quick review of the project, and then we can talk about the specifics and maybe go back in time to how we arrived at this idea. But um, actually, if you can just click through, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a, a color yeah. commentary. And so, let me know if you hear audio, because there shouldn't be audio coming through. But right. <laughs> right on. Um, yeah, so, oh, the first thing to call it is we did have someone commission, or well, we commissioned an illustration uh, from a studio called uh, Friends of Type, which is the first thing you see there. So we did not make that. Uh, and that was just to give it a little bit more flair. Since <laughs> this project was so long, we figured might as well invest a little bit more uh, aesthetic quality into the the essay. Yep. Um, but yeah, it starts off with uh, Ali giving uh, a small a uh, small portion of her routine uh, to to set the context, and then we give a little bit of a tutorial on on what it looks like at, or how to like. Um, interact with the article. And then we we have this premise that there's this moment 50 minutes into the show that's really funny. And by funny, we mean we had been measuring the duration of laughter uh, throughout the mini punchlines of the routine. And this this specific moment 50 minutes into the routine had some of the most, the longest duration of laughter of, of any point in the entire routine. So the entire premise of this, this essay was to dissect that moment of the routine and why it was the funniest moment funniest being the point at which there was the longest duration of laughter um so we then uh, over the course of you know several <laughs> animations and data visualizations try to explain why why we think this was so funny um so we'll let you reader uh go through that on your own um but that's that's basically the premise of the article and the the important thing is really i think to for this for this uh this chat is to really talk about the journey of how we got there um so how we arrived at this premise and the various iterations it took to get there um so does it anyway that, that's kind of like i think where we could where we could spend our time talking anything else to add russell no i mean i think you nailed it and i think um something worth noting is this is kind of different than a lot of uh ways that are visualizations end up where instead of trying to visualize all the data, we actually really focus on a very small portion of it in order to really deconstruct this idea rather than um, 
just kind of give you a giant survey of all the data. So I think um, that's definitely uh, represented in the way that we ended up um, presenting it, which is this kind of Instagram story stepper style approach. Yeah, we should definitely dissect why we went with this approach um, a little bit later. But when we like rewind and go back to May, and you had been thinking about this as an idea, and what was the first thing that you did uh, research-wise? Yeah, so I got that queued up. So the first thing I did, so basically myself and Caitlin Ralph, who was an intern at the time, and Amber Thomas, uh, another one of our coworkers, we just kind of looked at a whole bunch of different stand-up routines, uh, Ali Wong being one of them. And what I did was I grabbed the, the, the caption data from Netflix and I was able to convert it to a CSV file, which resulted in the spreadsheet you see here, um, which really just kind of gave me this pre-formatted uh, structured data to start a starting point. And we started just kind of collecting all the things that we could think about. So you see these other columns here. This one's callback, so a callback is when a comedian references an earlier part of the routine. Um, we tracked the laughter duration. Uh, we tra tracked these things we call, they're called levels over here, but basically it's just trying to like um, annotate the different topics that were discussed in the routines. And so we did this manually, as you can see, for about four or five different routines before we even really knew what we were ending trying to make. And um, this is essentially just a whole lot of manual legwork in terms of collecting the data. Um, and so that was that was a really big chunk of time and part of the reason like I already felt uh, totally like I needed to do something with this project is because we spent so long collecting the data. And the, what was, I actually don't know the answer to this question, what was the premise behind getting the laughter duration? Because that is very different than what your original idea was was after watching Mike Berbiglia's routine and, and under, trying to understand like how he got to a certain point, I feel like the laughter duration was not, was, was almost like a, just a, a gravy add on to the research effort. Yeah. So the laughter was definitely secondary. Um, I think we decided to start looking at laughter when I started doing a little bit of uh, reading about act, like comedy from like comedians perspectives. And there was this metric I found called laughs per minute. And so that got me thinking like some comedians actually will like track their laughs per minute. And I was like, oh, maybe there's something that we can glean by comparing different comedians laughs per minute to see if there was some sort of quantitative insight there. Um, so that was actually the initial premise of tracking laughter. Yeah. So um, viewer, you'll probably notice that our entire article is using metric that was almost like haphazardly added on by Russell, um, which will... Uh, forebode what 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 happened later in in the process so we we tracked all this data and you actually did this for other comedians as well so there's actually another version of this for uh a few other comedians that we also that you also worked with amber and caitlin to pull together yeah so we looked at a whole bunch um we looked at like an early uh eddie murphy routine uh we looked at like aziz ansari um I think I also did a Mike Birbiglia. So we did, did a whole bunch and also initially did some uh, prototypes that was let me kind of uh, kind of take a look at how they looked individually. So like this is um, one way I was looking at presenting the data, this idea of steps and levels. Um, and I think this was actually Ali Wong. Um, but we did this for all the different comedians to get a sense of if there was kind of some similarities or what was different or what was unique um, to help us figure out what the story would end up being. Um, and what happened after you designed all these? I remember you had like a mock-up either in Figma or Keynote or something that was like, wait, but what style or wait, but why style? <laughs> yeah. Do you have that uh, set up anywhere? I honestly don't think I have that anymore, but I can show you like, uh, so part of the uh, the nine month journey is we kind of, I had this vision for the story and it looked actually more like, let's see, um, it looked like this, where I was really just kind of going through the text of the routine and showing the levels as they progressed. Um, and basically at the end of this, uh, we do a bunch of feedback, uh, internal feedback um, kind of reviews with our team. And 
everyone was a little bit uh, lukewarm about it, to say, the, to say the least, in terms of getting excited about it. So we decided to shelve it for like a couple months and come back to it with some fresh eyes. And that's Matt when you kind of came in and brought some new life to the story. I, I don't remember people being that lukewarm. I don't know. I, I thought it was great. Maybe um, I think it sounded, if I remember correctly, you were, you were less like pumped about that direction, just like emotionally. I think that, I'm including myself in, in, yeah. in the group feedback. Like I know, like there was, there wasn't, there wasn't a, a, comp- a clear point to what the story was about. And I think that's where I was having some difficulty figuring out how to actually present it. Yeah. I mean, that's also a function of like a lot of our ideas. They're not totally flushed out. Like there's not a clear question in mind. I think this one actually had a question, but even then I think in retrospect, it was really like a broad idea around how people, how comedians arrive at their punchlines. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's, that's exactly like a question people debate. Um, But what what that can often lead to is like the actual question after you do all your research um and i think i think we've done a few projects where you start with something this broad and you start collecting data and you're like oh i don't know if there's a story here or not so um i think part of the reason was just the nature of picking something really broad and sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't um so what happened i think was you had gotten to that point and um I think I was eager um, using this for something. So mm-hmm. we had talked a lot about how to how to essentially spin this into something that was more narratively led. And then I guess did I? I think I pitched you the story that we would use this laughter climax. I think that's what happened. Was you ba- you basically took me through the data and what you had found, and then mm-hmm. I would, I basically pitched the team, including Russell, like, okay, what if we went this direction? And is that right? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much like was the missing ingredient because um, the uh, I'm getting a little feedback. <laughs> uh, the end, the end result um, was still uh, centered around this notion of levels and and nesting topics. Um, but I think what we were really missing was like what was the hook that was tying it all together, and that ended up being this uh, essentially like the point that the laughter climax where it was this big moment at the end, really brought everything that I was documenting with this uh, spreadsheet. It kind of brought it all together nice and cohesively. Um, and I think that's really what <laughs> made me uh, re-believe in the, in the story, so to speak. Yeah, and, and that's also to say, like, we, we then spent at least three months, like, massaging... Well, I would say, like, yeah, about two months massaging the story. So I think we hit a point maybe in November where we were like, okay, this is a premise that I think narratively has legs. Um, And then there was actually a lot of time spent outlining the story. Like we, we had like parts one through five and like chapter one was explaining the premise and chapter two is like explaining the idea of callbacks. We had like a very, very long narrative outline um, done in like Google Sheets, mm-hmm. and I think I'd spent a lot of time researching comedy and other types of media that use form. So in this case, we have the uh, that's currently on the screen the idea of like scenes and acts in theater and in film uh, mm-hmm. being a good parallel to these ideas of level one, level two, level three in comedy. Um, so. Yeah, we there was a lot of like thinking around the story. So a lot uh, once we we were we felt really good about the story though, uh, we moved into mocking it up, and yeah. that was also a really long journey too. So we I think started in like uh, keynote, like we had keynote slides with like very crappy versions of the charts. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, and then eventually we moved into Figma. Actually, yeah, you can probably pull up the. Uh, yeah, I can bring in the Figma doc. I was actually showing this recently. Um, so, like, our end result was actually uh, not to say it was prescriptive, but um, the development was 
pretty easy because we did a lot of high fidelity, not we, mostly Matt did a lot of high fidelity mocking up. So we really storyboarded this thing um, pretty exactly uh, because it was a very, like we said, it's a very like hand holy experience. Um, so we just wanted to make sure we got the beats right. And so as you can see, this looks very similar to what the end result um, of the actual essay and ended up looking like um, with just a few really, really visual differences, nothing structurally too much different. Um, so yeah, Figma was a huge, huge asset here because it let us actually see what the pacing felt like. And I think we made a lot of actual alterations once we put all the whole story idea into Figma because we got a sense of what was kind of too long and what was maybe too verbose or what needed more explanation just by doing it this way. Yeah, I, I am a huge fan of Figma. One, because we can work collaboratively. Uh, I think I typically would do the same process in Keynote. Mm -hmm. um, some people use Illustrator, other people use Sketch. I think the beauty of using Figma is we had just one place where all the design was. Mm -hmm. And I could make updates and then Russell could just jump in and be like, oh, okay, I get it. Or I could just change a thing and say, hey, do you like this? Or alternatively, Russell could be coding and be like, oh, frame two makes no sense. Do you mean this or do you mean this? And I could just go in and make the change. Um, so Figma functions kind of like Google Docs. You can see each other's cursors. You can make real time updates and it auto updates on the other person's screen. Um, so it's it's a really good asset for collaboration. Obviously, there's no interactivity. Um, there's very, very light coding. Um, like like add-ons so you can kind of you can see like the css kind of the css for a lot of the elements but there mm -hmm. isn't like padding on anything um right so yeah this was a a really big tool in the process uh yeah and um and then so i basically leaned into the the design and then the story and then Russell was solely focused on the implementation and obviously had a role in the story and design as, as well. Um, but I didn't touch the code. <laughs> so, uh, we, we definitely specialize. And I think we've done that a few times on super teams. I think it's, it's actually a good um, like skill set overlap because I think I'm a faster designer and Russell's a faster coder. So we can, we can actually like complement each other really well in that way. Yeah, I think I think it all depends on the project. Sometimes it's great when like everyone is digging into the code. And I think sometimes like as a case like this, it makes sense to, to separate roles. Um, so it ended up like, I feel like it worked out nicely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So what do you have anything to add on the uh, the design choices here as you go through this? So why did you decide to do a stepper versus a scrolly? Yeah, um, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, I've done a lot of scrolly driven graphics in the recent past. So I think it's nice to just have a diversity in terms of like what you're working on from like development perspective. Um, but I also, I guess I've just been on Instagram a lot lately and the Instagram stories thing is, it's just very intuitive and it's straightforward. And I think the other nice thing about it is, um, you have a little more control as the creator like you're more you're more like you're more editing what's going into the material because you have a confined space to work with um and i think i kind of liked that approach especially for this when um we're not dealing with a data set that's familiar to anybody it's like this new made up data set so i think it was beneficial to be able to chunk things out into like really small components um, in order to like really slowly build up all the different concepts that we're kind of exploring. Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons that I think it made more sense to, to do it this way. Yeah. The one downside is we really don't have any, con there's no, there's very little interaction built mm -hmm. in. Um, there are a few points where you can click on a link and hear audio. Yeah. Uh, but there's no hover events, obviously, because we're assuming you can hover. <laughs> um, that th am I getting that right? Like you really didn't build a desktop and a mobile version. It's it's kind of the same thing in both instances, except obviously screen size. 
Yeah, it's pretty much a single experience. So like the only assumption is that you click like left or right to go forward and back. And like you said, there's a few instances, I think we are already passed them, but like these could have audio blips. But other than that, it's mostly like you see what you see is what you get. Um, so I think it made it just a little more accessible, but obviously with the sacrifice of interactivity. Yeah. What was like the hardest thing that you found coding this type of experience for the first time? Um, so this is all about like state management. So like, because you're controlling one thing on the screen at a time, you have to have, uh, and we made it so like users could advance at their own pace. So when you're dealing with, um, these animations where things like trickle in or like draw one after the other, but you're also letting the user like click, 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 um, making sure like all your D3 object constancy is working and like you're not like there's, there's a lot of um, room for things to like break or overlap. So just really managing the state between the different slides is I guess like was the tough thing about this. Um, but the nice thing was also that since every slide I made it so it didn't matter where you're coming from or where you're going to, it made it a little more um, interchangeable. So like you could move slides around if need be. Um, and every slide kind of operated in its own bubble. It just needed to know like the data that was coming at it and the view that it was presenting. Um, so it was, it was a lot of upfront work, but once I got all those pieces in place, it was pretty nice. I actually don't know the answer to this question. So are you destroying all the elements on every slide and then recreating them? Or does it know when to tween things that are shared among the slides? Uh, it knows. So it's not, it's not totally, it depends on the case. So like it knows, like, um, this is what I called like the, the, the topic bar chart. And so like whenever it, it knows if it's a topic, it knows if the data already exists or not. So it is doing um, just like your typical D3 joins um, and updates and whatnot. Wow. I, I need to dig into the code to know how you did that. <laughs> I think I just was like, this is going to be, I can barely keep like consistency jumping between like steps on a scrolly tail thing. So I I usually just have like hundreds of global variables so that things can get borrowed and changed. Um, but yeah, I would imagine there's just like a function that's taking tons of parameters that you're feeding into it and some are unique to slides and some aren't. Yeah. Yeah. And so I pretty much tried to, uh, separate, there's basically like a few main chunks. There's like this bar, which was its own special chunk. And then there's these arcs, which was its own separate chunk. And so they would, again, like I said, just take in the data and a little bit, a few other options and they'd be able to manage those transitions. Yeah. Do you think that when it's all said and done, there there's something to be said with doing it this way versus just having a animator like do all the things, you know? Because <laughs> uh, drawing a lot of these charts is much easier in After Effects versus code. However, um, making small changes or doing like the nuanced transitions is almost impossible in After Effects. Like you have to have the data binded to the elements in code in order to pull that off. Yeah, I think it's a really it's a really gray area because like if we were a hundred percent on what our story was and what the data was, and even like which sections to focus on, um, I would absolutely say do this in After Effects. But like we at any point in time, we could change anything, and like you know, with a snap of the finger, it would just automatically. So like if we decide to not focus on this whole section here and decide to focus on like a, a section at the end of her routine, it would still totally work. And that would, you'd have to totally redo it if you were doing After Effects. Um, so I think we changed stuff up enough to make it worthwhile. But it, if it was this case where we were like 100% locked down on everything, it would have made more sense to do it in After Effects. Yeah. I think it was one of the things I was thinking about. I was like, okay, this looks great, but if you just spent more time than just like making an SVG version of this in Figma. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I think the other thing is like, I always like the potential, like I could make this more interactive. Like if I wanted to, we could have added, like when you hover on this bar, you can actually see all the dialogue from that section. So we didn't end up doing that, but the potential to do that is there because it's all data driven. So 
Yeah, I I personally wanted to have like a even another section on the end that was like an exploratory version of kind of what Russell had mocked up um, earlier in our chat in uh, like the the image files that you were showing. Oh yeah, and because um, I think now that we have this story and this premise and like why this was interesting, okay, now we can have this like explorable version that people can jump into and gain more empathy about how comedians structure their routines. Um, I think we also hit a point of it just needed to ship. Like we had been working on that. Well, Russell had put way more hours into this. All I'd done is like jumped in three fourths of the way and said, Hey, what if we angle the story around this and help write the story and do the design. But I think doing a lot of those extra things was certainly on the table, but I think we, we also wanted to see this go live so that we all can move on to new projects. Um, yeah. which is just always important too. Yeah. And there's definitely, there's a point where like, there's a return, you're losing, you, like your return on investment is just t totally diminishing, right? Or what's it called? Diminishing returns. Yeah. So I think, you know, that it's like, we just had to get this out in the wild for the sake of, I think my own sanity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and after a while, I think when you're working on a story, you know, the size of the audience and not every story needs to be like a million view situation like there are projects that you do that you know have smaller audiences but you know that those readers will really appreciate the project and you're going deep on something that is really interesting to you and it might not be interesting to everyone but there's certainly people who will read it and i think after a while it's like yes you can put in more time but does that improve the reader's experience for that but that nerd out person that wants to that is interested in the topic and also it doesn't really broaden the appeal from an audience perspective mm -hmm. um, so i think that we, we definitely were starting to sense that as we hit month eight <laughs> on the project um and there's always the ability to do a follow-up story right like we have other data and there's other things we could do so if for some reason we get re-excited by it or see like a huge uh huge uh, community discussing it and wanting more then there's always that option yeah, definitely. This is also um, one of the, I would say one of the most like handholdy projects we've ever done where there's no exploration and it's really like a clear linear, you're on the train tracks with us being pulled through. Mm -hmm. um, so we had never done this before. And I think just by shipping it, we had good empathy of how people would respond to a project like this and whether it was worthwhile doing something just linearly linear storytelling again mm -hmm. and uh, actually i just want to like mention this uh so anyone out there that's interested in analytics i put a lot of custom tracking on this um so actually there's about 30 something uh slides in here if we want to call them that and um i was tracking basically how far uh users got into the story and usually with anything even if it's a scroll driven thing you expect a pretty sharp drop off as like the further people go. Um, and this has been, I don't have the numbers in front of me, um, but there is basically once people started getting into it, they really kind of made it through to the end, um, which to me tells me that it was worthwhile to, to tell the story in this way. Um, and I can post those numbers actually somewhere later if people are interested. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm interested. I haven't looked at them yet. Um, Another thing is we we haven't had Ali Wong tweet it, which is kind of a bummer. But uh, <laughs> you know, some things have a really really long, um, like half life. Not half life, mm -hmm. but um, I worked on a project on uh, the geography of music uh, using YouTube data, and even that took like two months before anyone to write anything about it. And then there was just like a flurry of um, articles. So there's I think there's still hope that Ali Wong will will tweet a thing <laughs> that, that is the um, ultimate goal yeah maybe she has seen it and we just don't know um, <laughs> or she doesn't use twitter uh yeah well i i think this was like a huge achievement and i think the response was great and um again like i think there is a audience out there that really likes to nerd out on comedy you know that's not everyone on the internet but i think like those that really enjoy comedy and certainly enjoy Ali Wong's work, like really loved the piece and loved how we nerded out on it and tried to articulate something that makes her 
routine special, not necessarily unique. A lot of people were like, this isn't unique to Ali Wong, which is uh, very fair. But mm -hmm. I think we, some of the things that we appreciated about our work, we were able to highlight in the article. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any, what else, is there anything else we should, we should talk about? Oh, this obviously did very well on mobile too, in the sense that it was completely built for mobile. If you remember the Figma, um, mockups, um, so this was one of our first forays into like mobile first, I guess. Uh, am I getting that right? Have you ever done like a, a mobile first pudding essay? Uh, I I mean, I don't think I, uh, no, okay. I've never designed for it to be consumed mobile first. So I think that was definitely the first time that that was like the starting point for the design. So I think, yeah, this was a first. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it, it, it worked out well. I think it's weird working with 400 in, well, it's less, yeah, like 400 pixels of width. I think that's what I had the Figma um, frame set at, which is just like not a lot of space. <laughs> um, it's not a lot of space. <laughs> definitely not a lot of space. And it's also interesting to like think of your charts vertically um, from the, from the very beginning. So when we were, like drawing timelines, I was like, oh, this is going to be 400 pixels wide, not like 800 or 1200. Um, or can we draw this? Can we orient this vertically rather than horizontally? Um, yeah, that's definitely something that's always difficult, especially with timelines when you kind of naturally, in a lot of cases, think of time on the x axis, right? So I think, I think certain timelines make sense vertically, but it's definitely like a bit of an orientation change for, for people consuming timelines, which is a difficult design problem, which we chose to not do. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing we didn't, we, we considered doing, but didn't do was adding a narration. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think it could have worked out, but we also realized that we're not expert videographers and, um, syncing the visuals with narration, which would obviously require timing, um, could have been a path that we go down, could have gone down, but would have been another thing that wouldn't necessarily have paid out the returns for the effort gone in. Um, but that was just another thing on the table, I think could have made it interesting for a certain type of audience that doesn't want to tap through a thing. They just want to watch a video essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. Anything else to add Russell for this, uh, this project? Uh, I think that's it for me. Uh, I just want to say, Thanks for working on with it with me and getting it across the finish line. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess thanks for watching, um, putting audience and, uh, we'll hopefully have another one in a couple few weeks. All right. All right. See ya.